everybody, welcome back to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube to increase your neuroscience IQ. Thanks for joining us again today for another week's video, and if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe for our weekly neuroscience videos. Today's video, we are going to be doing a little bit of a Mythbusters episode where we're going to analyze a naturopathic medicine and see if the effects that it promises could actually be occurring. So sit tight, stay tuned, let's roll the intro. Welcome back again. Today on Medicine Mythbusters, we're looking at Cordyline, a stress manager that promises to increase resistance to stress and anxiety. Does it work or is it just a placebo effect? That's what we're going to examine today. Naturopathic medicine tends to be a bit of a pseudoscience in many people's eyes, with most people either accepting or rejecting the theories based on their own personal beliefs. But I wanted to get to the science behind Cordyline and look at each of the ingredients and see if it can actually help manage stress. So, does it work or is it just a placebo? According to the packaging, Cordyline contains a unique variety of botanicals and nutrients shown to have a synergistic blunting effect on stress and anxiety as well as normalizing cortisol secretion. So. I looked at the first ingredient, which is ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is also known as Indian winter cherry, so it's just a plant. And according to the package, ashwagandha has a number of adaptogenic effects, including modulating GABA receptors, which is partly responsible for the significant reduction in anxiety and stress as shown in clinical trials. But what are these clinical trials? I wanted to check it out for myself. So I started exploring and the first study I saw from 1982 showed that ashwagandha seems to increase stress resistance and act as a bit of an adaptogen. But I wanted more recent studies, so I kept looking. I found a double-blind, randomized, and placebo-controlled study that showed subjective effects. These effects, however, were on healthy, athletic individuals, and that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted to see the effects on anxious individuals, because that's probably who is going to purchase Cordyline. The next study I saw was from 2019, so recent enough, and it looked at insomnia and anxiety in adults that were under chronic stress. So these were individuals that presented as stressed from a pre-screening survey. What was seen was that with sleep actigraphy, they improved many aspects of sleep, including sleep efficiency, sleep latency, which is just the amount of time it takes you to fall asleep, and sleep quality, which was measured with the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. But what also improved was the subjective scores of anxiety. I wanted to see studies that looked at the biological aspects, so not just the subjective side. Luckily, I found one that was a two-month study looking at mildly anxious individuals, and it showed a reduction in cortisol levels in their blood. The authors noted that this reduction was also evident in the placebo group. However, there was a greater reduction in the people that actually received treatment. So in the placebo group, there was a 24% reduction, but in the ashwagandha group, there was a 41% reduction, which is significantly greater. Now, there's suggestions that the effects are because it's an antioxidant, it has anti-inflammatory effects. They think that it may be interacting with GABAergic and serotonergic systems, much like SSRIs, which are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, that are used to usually treat depression. Ashwagandha is actually an agonist of GABA receptors, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this could be why it's having effects on reducing anxiety, improving sleep, reducing muscle spasms, and it even has been suggested for use for treating seizures, which is a seizure happens when there's too much excitability in the brain, and 
excitability happens with glutamate, whereas GABA has an antagonizing effect to glutamate. So GABA and glutamate work against each other, and when we have too much excitability with glutamate, GABA can come in and help to reduce that excitement. If you also check out our sleep video, you can see the important role of GABA in sleep, which can help suggest the reasons why GABA and ashwagandha might be improving sleep in these anxious individuals. Now the next ingredient on Cordyline is Relora Blend. Based on the packaging, Relora Blend is a combination of magnolia and phyllodendron that has a significant synergistic effect for reducing stress and anxiety, and apparently has been shown to reduce salivary cortisol levels and perception of stress, to improve other mood parameters such as depression, and to prevent stress-related weight gain compared to a placebo. Now, ah, the packaging actually cites all this information with studies that have been done. So I looked into the studies as well to see if they were credible. What I did find based on my studies was that Relora Blend is a combination of Magnolia officinalis, which has the active ingredient of Honokyol, and Phyllodendron amurinis, which has the active ingredient of Berberine. The claims of Relora Blend reducing stress and improving mood were actually seen in a study that looked at the salivary cortisol levels comparing a placebo to Relora. Also, the global mood seemed to improve. In the scale that was used, a lower score is better mood, so the decrease in score with Relora is a better mood overall, and the stress also showed a significant reduction. They also looked at moods like tension, depression, anger, fatigue, confusion, and vigor, and the results were positive for all of them. So on the package, magnolia bark is actually listed as a separate ingredient, despite the fact that it is part of Relora blend. So I looked at studies on magnolia bark alone. Magnolia bark's active ingredient is honokyol, which is a lipid, and so this lipid, if you look at how it looks, it can actually pass through the blood-brain barrier. It acts on GABA receptors, NFK receptors, NMDA receptors, and tends to have anxiolytic, analgesic, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, and neuroprotective effects. So I looked into this, and I wanted to see how it can work. The neuroprotective effects that people claim magnolia bark has come from, first off, the fact that it can cross the blood-brain barrier. It's said that it can reduce excitotoxicity. Basically, the way Honokyle works can allow quicker recovery after an action potential. If you want to watch our Neuroscience ABC series, there is a video dedicated to action potentials, if that's not something you're familiar with. But basically, after a nerve fires, it has to recover. And the recovery happens with this ATPase that pumps sodium out of the cell and potassium back into the cell and magnolia bark can augment and preserve this function. So after a nerve fires, it can restore back to normal faster. It also blocks NMDA receptors and we've talked about long-term potentiation in other videos as well. Basically, an NMDA receptor opens and allows calcium into the cell, which is important for downstream effects that promote learning. But too much calcium in the cell is toxic, and so blocking the NMDA receptors can help reduce this toxicity. Binding to the NFK receptors blocks the inflammatory response in glial cells, and this has all come together to actually show that it can decrease plaque formation in Alzheimer's. For sleep, the magnolia bark acts with GABA receptors, and just like we talked about for the very first ingredient, this action can help promote inhibition in the brain and allow sleep to happen. Again, check out the sleep video if you want to know the whole circuitry responsible for sleep and how GABA plays a role in that. It has all these actions and mechanisms that have been reviewed. So that is what magnolia bark can do. The next ingredient, philodendron, 
has similar actions. So the active ingredient in it is berberine and it has been shown to work for depression, um, bipolar disorder, and anxiety. And if you look, this review nicely listed all the mechanisms of action and cited papers that talked about those specific mechanisms for treating different disorders. So, berberine is a neuromodulator in the central nervous system. It was first used in Chinese medicine, but based off science, it seems to have transferable effects for Western medicine. Its therapeutic effects come from its anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, antimicrobial, and hepatoprotective actions. It can pass the blood-brain barrier, just like magnolia bark, and for treatment of anxiety, a low dose increases amines. So a low dose actually increases amines. High doses of berberine reduce amines. So this can actually decrease serotonin activity by binding to autoreceptors that inhibit the other serotonin receptors. I know that's a lot to process, but basically what's happening is berberine binds to serotonin receptors that tell the body how much serotonin there is and say, there's a lot of serotonin right now, we don't need to make any more. Berberine binds to it to reduce the amount of serotonin released. Serotonin can actually trigger anxiety. So having berberine bind to the serotonin autoreceptors and say we have enough serotonin, reducing the amount of serotonin being made can help reduce the anxiety. But the problem is if people have comorbidities like depression, we don't want to reduce their serotonin even more as that can have negative effects on their symptoms. So like with anything, before you take any drug, you should consult your doctor or a medical practitioner that can help you gauge whether or not you need it or if you should be taking it. Somebody needs to come up with an educated workup. Now, berberine also inhibits glutamate, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter, and so it can inhibit glutamate, reduce the amount of glutamate and serotonin, and so because of that, glutamate, we said was excitatory, reducing the excitation can help to calm down the nervous system. It also binds to the benzodiazepine site on GABA receptors. GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It's the main inhibitory factor. It's important for sleep. But basically, if berberine binds to the benzodiazepine site, it's promoting the action of GABA and inhibiting areas of the brain that can reduce excitation in the brain. Next ingredient is theanine. What the package says is that theanine has also been shown to reduce anxiety in clinical trials and to reduce both subjective stress and cortisol production in response to a stressful situation. Now again, I recommend you read that and go to the sources that they cited and I'll talk about the sources that I found. So when I looked up theanine, it is an amino acid analog of the proteinogenic amino acids L-glutamate and L-glutamine. It's found in green tea, it's found in fungi, and also black tea as well. What they saw in patients with general anxiety disorder is that there was actually no improvement in their anxiety compared to the placebo. But the patients did sleep better. So I guess that's a good thing. They had less insomnia than the placebo group but their stress decreased just as much as the placebo group. And that was about all I could find on theanine. So its research on its role with stress was a little less than all the other ones, and the paper that I found showed that it could improve sleep, which is important in people who have anxiety because anxiety can lead to sleeping issues, and sleep is very important for the health of your brain. So, even if you're not anxious, make sure you're getting sleep. The final ingredient that was listed as medicinal is phosphatidylserine. And I recognize this name because I actually learned about it in my biochem classes. This is 
a phospholipid that plays a critical role in neuronal cell structure and function, and it's been shown to blunt the stress response, improve mood, and normalize cortisol release, according to the package. What I found in my research was that phosphatidylserine, which they listed as coming from Helianthus anis, which is just a sunflower seed, can reduce salivary cortisol in response to acute stress. So this would be when you have a stressor, the salivary cortisol was significantly lower in a group with a higher dose compared to the low dose group and compared to the placebo. So it has to be the right dose in order to have these mitigative effects on stress. But what I was also interested in is that this listed sunflower seed as the ingredient but phosphatidylserine. So I want to know if they're putting actual sunflower seed in, which would have a lot more chemicals in it, chemicals, than phosphatidylserine, or if they're just concentrating the phosphatidylserine from a sunflower, because it could be completely different. Anyway, this phospholipid is also important in glial cells. It covers and protects the nerves, so it can be important for your overall brain health. It's also a messenger for cell signaling and apoptosis. So, there have been studies that show and support that all the ingredients in this can reduce stress. Now, again, you should always talk to your healthcare practitioner before you decide if something's right for you. But, now it's up to you to decide. Is cordyline just a naturopathy myth or could it actually be used as medicine? Thanks for watching today's video. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and return next week. See you next time. Thanks for watching.